Good morning. And welcome to our service this morning here at Jermoyne Baptist Church. We're thankful that you are here joining us via technology, via YouTube for those who are watching on YouTube or on Zoom um, for those who are with us here. Uh, we're going to start our worship service together in a normal manner by reading a psalm. And today's psalm is Psalm 18. And we will read from verse 43 through to verse 50. Psalm 18 in your Bibles. We'll read from verse 43 through to verse 50. Psalms 18 and reading from verse 43. You have delivered me from the attacks of the people. You have made me the head of nations. People I did not know are subject to me. As soon as they hear me, they obey me. Foreigners cringe before me. They all lose heart. They come trembling from their strongholds. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. <clears throat> Excuse me. Exalted be God, my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From violent men, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you among the nations, O Lord. I will sing praises to your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in praise and in worship, for you are the living God. We echo the psalmist, the Lord lives, exalted be God my Saviour. Praise be to my rock. Heavenly Father, we glorify your name today. For you have done everything for us. Lord, we praise you for you created us in your likeness. We praise you that though we had turned from you, you redeemed us to yourself in Jesus Christ. We praise him, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. We praise him who did everything well and subjected himself to death, death upon a cross, that through his death we might be forgiven. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And so we confess this morning that we have sinned against you. We pray that you would forgive us in, in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray also today that though we are disparate, that we are separated because of uh, the, the virus which is taking hold in this country. We pray, Heavenly Father, we might be able to focus upon you today. We pray that we might grow in our knowledge of you and our love of you, that we might worship you together in spirit and truth and the unity that comes through christ jesus we pray heavenly father we pray that your word would be effective for us today that we would hear from your word that we would be doers of your word and that your word would sanctify us and make us more like our lord and savior jesus christ heavenly father we pray that you would have your way with us that even in isolation in all that we do your name might be glorified in us for you are worthy to receive all glory honor and praise we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first song this morning, which is God has spoken by his prophets. The first verse is God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging word, each from age to age proclaiming God the one, the righteous okay, it's Lord. Right. It's right. Rejoice the Lord is king. Okay. I think I've got the wrong verse. It's actually rejoice the Lord is king. So let's sing that song. Rejoice the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let's sing together. Your 
now time for us to bring some announcements to your attention. The first one being that all church activities that are normally open to the public are cancelled during this time of COVID-19. However, our Sunday 10 a.m. services via live stream on YouTube and via Zoom are still available. I will encourage you if you're on Zoom and sitting in your homes, please turn your videos on. It's a great encouragement to us to actually see each other as we worship our Lord together. Also, our next announcement, there is an elders meeting on tonight again at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom for the elders of the church. Note too that our Tuesday night Bible study continues at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom and we are studying Psalms. Everyone is welcome to join and it is a good time of fellowship and gathering around God's word. If you're interested, please contact Joel for details. Note also that during this time of lockdown, our members and attendees are encouraged to contact one another to encourage one another through the reading of, of scripture and prayer. Please use this time if you can to contact each other. And if you do not have contact details of someone you'd like, please contact Joel and he will pass on those in person. Also know that church offerings can be done directly by uh, bank deposit. Uh, as always, we reserve offerings for members of the church. For those who are uh, simply visitors, do not feel obliged that you need to give. For anyone who would like to give, the details are there for you. That's all I have for the announcements this morning, so I'd ask Joel forward for the children's talk. Well, good morning, children. I hope you come up close to your TV screens. Oh, I can see some of you there. Hudson, yeah, there you go. All right, this morning we're going to hear another story from the Children's Bible. Uh, this one is the Beginner's Gospel Story Bible by Jared Kennedy. Uh, and so this tells a story about the, Lord about the Lord Jesus when he was here on earth and the way he responded to children. So it says here, Everywhere Jesus went, people gathered around him. Sometimes the people brought their children to see Jesus too. Jesus would sit with the children and pray for them and show them his love. See the children coming to Jesus? 
One day, a group of children ran up to Jesus, but Jesus' friends held out their hands. Stop, they said. Jesus is very busy. He has many important things to do. Jesus needs to teach the grown-ups. Jesus needs to heal sick people. Jesus does not have time for children. But Jesus' friends were wrong. Jesus loves little children. He is not too busy to help them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them from coming. Jesus wants even the youngest and smallest children to come to him. In fact, Jesus said, my kingdom belongs to people who are just like these children. See, the biggest ones and even the smallest ones, the oldest ones and even the youngest ones are welcome to come to Jesus. Will you come to Jesus? You can pray and talk to Jesus anytime. You're not too little. Jesus is not too busy. Jesus loves talking with you and Jesus loves little children. And this is important for us to remember, particularly in the passage that we'll be looking at in the sermon today. It tells us that Jesus is the head of his body and his body is the church. And so Jesus gets to decide who is a part of his church and who is not. He is the head. And we have to remember that, that there the disciples were trying to be the head of the church and saying, children, you can't come. But Jesus is the one and he welcomes us all. And so we need to welcome other people into his kingdom as well. That means welcoming other children if you're a child. And adults, we need to remember to welcome children as well because that is what Jesus wants us to do as the head and we as his body, we don't choose who belongs. It is Jesus who chooses. And so if a child trusts and loves the Lord Jesus, they are welcome. Uh, to, they should be welcome in our church and welcome to us as part of Jesus' bodies. Uh, you listened well. You can go and get a little bit further back so your parents can see the screen now, if you like. It's now time for our first Bible reading this morning, and that comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah will be reading from chapter 49, and we'll read the first seven verses. The Old Testament book of Isaiah, roughly in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah chapter 49, and we'll read from verse 1 through to verse 7. Isaiah 49, and reading from verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. <clears throat> but I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nations, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see 
and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. It's now time for our prayer. I'll ask Joel to come back up and lead us. Yes, let us come before God in prayer. Let's speak with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You're the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? But Lord, even as we recognize that you are the stronghold of our lives, you are our light and our salvation, so often we do struggle with fear. We are not, we are not as confident as we should be, and so often fear our fellow man. And when enemies attack, we stumble and fall far too often. We do not seek you in the day of trouble as we should, even though we proclaim on Sundays that you are our stronghold, our salvation, our fortress. Uh, we do not flee to you in the midst of trouble. And so, Lord, we come before you and ask for forgiveness for having such a small faith. We profess to have great confidence in you. We follow often in the footsteps of the Apostle Peter and say that we would die for you but then in the very next hours, we fall so easily. And so, Lord, we ask that you'd be merciful to us and forgive us for the smallness of our faith and accept the blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf again. Lord, we pray that you would not hide your face from us or turn away from your servants in anger for our, our changing nature. Lord, we pray that you would not reject us or forsake us, but instead that you would still be our saviour. We thank you that even if we have a very small faith, that we are saved because through that faith runs the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness, cleanses us from all our fears, our anxieties, our worries as fickle people. And so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and then give us strength, increase our faith, O oh Lord, so that when we face future troubles, you may be there helping us and that we would wait upon you and be strong and take heart because we know that we have a God who is our stronghold, our fortress, our ever-present help in trouble. Lord, we also pray for your work going on throughout this world, and we pray particularly for Bible translators. Lord, we thank you for these people who give of their lives so that others may read your word without hindrance, without needing to know the original languages, but instead can read your word in their mother tongue. Lord, we pray that you would continue to cause translations to be created, and Lord, we pray that those who do the work of translation would not be deceitful in their translations, but they would make translations that are true and accurate and in accordance with what you have proclaimed so many years ago. And so, Lord, we pray that people would take up your word and read it and be encouraged to look to Christ for salvation. Lord, we also pray for those even doing translation work in our own country. We think of those serving on Aboriginal communities and translating your word. Lord, we pray that they would be able to continue to do this work it's so terrible to think that there are parts of your word that have not been translated into the language of the Aboriginal people, into their different dialects, so that they cannot uh, hear your word in their own tongue. And so, Lord, we pray that this would not be. We pray that more and more books of uh, the Bible would be translated so that people can read your word and be edified by all of it. Lord, we also pray for your work going on in other parts of our country. And we pray particularly for the work of scripture in schools. Our Lord, it grieves us that we cannot go into schools uh, at this stage, that we have been confined uh, and the scripture teachers are not allowed to enter. Lord, we pray that the lockdown would be lifted in due course so that scripture teachers can resume teaching the gospel so that children can be uh, sound in the faith and that they would continue to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we know that there are many false teachings that abound in our society about you and about the world that we live in. Lord, we pray that this would not be, and we pray that children would not be led astray by uh, the myths of men. But instead, oh, Lord, we pray that they would be hearing the truth from your word, even in the public schools. Lord, we also pray for your work going on with other churches that are dear to us. And we think this morning, particularly of Southern Districts Reformed Baptist Church. Lord, we thank you for the pastor there, for Andrew Harrison. We thank you for the other elders, for, uh, for Basil and Moniki. Lord, we pray that that church would be pure in all things. And Lord, we pray that the actions of that church would always be affirming that you are their God. Lord, we pray that the teaching of that church would always be in accord with sound doctrine so that many are saved and so that your saints there are edified. 
Lord, we also pray for our own community that we think of the people who live in Des Moines. Lord, we pray for them. We have a real responsibility for the salvation of their souls as they are so close to us uh, geographically. Lord, we pray that the people of Des Moines would be convicted of their rebellion against you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would work upon the hearts of the people in Des Moines, convicting them and bringing them to revival in an understanding of their creator. So Lord, we ask that you would have mercy on the people of Des Moines and change them so that they are fit for service in your kingdom. Oh Lord, we pray that this would be an epicenter, a revival that sweeps around Sydney and even further afield into Australia. Lord, we pray that you would do a mighty work here. And Lord, we pray that we would have the joy of seeing your Holy Spirit at work. Lord, we also pray for our church this morning. We pray particularly for the women of this church. Lord, we pray for the women that they would serve you, uh, those who are believers. Lord, we pray that they would be training, the older women would be training the younger women to love their husbands and children, that older women would be training younger women to be self-controlled and pure, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Oh, Lord, we know that people look at us and see the way that we live. And then your word can be maligned by the way that we live in out of step with it. And so, Lord, we pray for the women of this church that they may be holy and pure and be teaching one another and encouraging one another to keep in step with the spirit. Lord, we also pray for those in our church who are struggling with illnesses, struggling in pain and different types of suffering. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would encourage their hearts and we pray that they would once again remember and be convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of yourself that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that they would bask in your love even as they go through this time of trial. Lord, we also pray for us as a church that we would continue to uh, do the things that you ask us to uh, and that you would create a willing spirit in us to live in accordance with your word. And we pray particularly for us as a people who uh, should come to our God in song. Oh Lord, we pray that we would love to sing with joy in our hearts. We pray that that joy would spring from the hope that we have in yourself, that hope of a safe dwelling in heaven that is to come. Lord, we know that you are the one who hides us in the shelter of your tabernacle. You set us high upon the rock that is Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that we would love to stand upon Christ and sing your praises with joy in our hearts, knowing that we have salvation from sins. We have salvation from death. We have salvation from the enemy. And so, Lord, we pray that we at Dremoyne Baptist may be characterized by a joyful singing of praise to our God. Lord, we also pray for the members of this church. We thank you for each of them. We thank you for their commitment to you, but also to each other. Lord, we pray that our love at this church would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And we pray that this love would abound so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And so that then we are filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And may it all be to your glory and your praise. Amen. It's time now for our second song. Alas, and did my Saviour bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. Please stand and sing in your homes. At the cross and the cross where I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away If my sin I made, I received my sight And now I'm rejoicing all the day Was 
Please be seated if you're standing. It's now time for us to come and hear from God's word again. And the passage today is Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verse 15 through to verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 15 through to verse 23. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 15. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, to present you wholly into his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Let us come to God in prayer and ask for his blessing as we look at his word together. Heavenly Father, we come before you and ask that you would ensure the well-being of your servants this morning. Oh Lord, do not let the enemy oppress us as we seek your face. Lord, we pray that you would keep the enemy far from us. But instead, oh Lord, we pray that we would draw close to you and that we would 
have your face shine upon us and be blessed. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning we continue our series in the book of Colossians, which the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae many years ago. And we've been unpacking what uh, the Apostle Paul has to say about the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, particularly from verse 15 and following. And so we've seen last week how Jesus is the image of the invisible God and what that means. And this week I wanted to focus on verse 18. Verse 18 of Colossians chapter 1, which says, And he, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. Here we have another illustration that is given to us by the Apostle Paul to help us to understand who the Lord Jesus is, who the Lord Jesus is, and to remind the church in Colossae who have been distracted by false teaching, they are reminded who Jesus is in the fact that he is the head of the body, the church. Now, what does it mean if Jesus is the head of the body, the church? Well, the Apostle Paul is giving us uh, an illustration here to help us understand who Jesus is because we know something about the the head of our bodies and what that means to us. If we have a head, then we understand that then things happen in relation to our body as a result of the head's work. The head rules over our physical bodies. And therefore, if Jesus is the head, then he rules over over our physical bodies in similar ways that we understand our physical heads rule over our physical bodies. What are the kinds of things that our head does to our body? How does it rule our body? Well, one way that our head rules our body is by causing growth in our bodies. The pituitary gland is located in our skull, in our head, and that gland is responsible for the growth that happens within our bodies. The gland there, the pituitary gland, it releases hormones, which are chemical messages to the cells within our bodies. And those hormones tell the cells to grow and to develop into all that we are as tissues and organs and cartilage and bones. All those cells are functioning by these chemical messages that come from the pituitary gland, which is located in our heads. So our heads are responsible for the growth of our physical bodies. Also, our heads and we think of this most of all, are showing their rule of our bodies by the way that they cause our bodies to function. Our head is responsible for causing the functioning of our bodies. The head receives information from the body uh, and then it processes that information and then directs body parts to move and to function as it wills. Some people might like to say, oh no, it's the neck that controls the head. But no, the head controls the neck and the neck has to turn the, the, the head as at the command of the head. Uh, it has to turn it where the head wills, not where the neck wills. And that's the case for every other part of the body. It is functioning, it is moving based on the commands that are given from the head. And we know this, that if the head is out of commission, then the whole body shuts down. And the body is basically useless without a head. If you chop off a head, well, then the body is useless from then on and is only fit for burial, as many people have found through history and including even in church history. Uh, So there's Jesus, if he is the head of the body, the church, does he rule over his church in similar ways? In those two ways that I've outlined this morning, I mean, we could unpack this even further, but of course, the two obvious ones are growth and function, growth and function. Does Jesus rule over the church in similar ways? Yes, he does. Remembering that his body is the church, uh, that is clarified for us by the Apostle Paul in verse 18. Look with me at verse 18. And it says, and he is the head of the body, the church. Now, whenever we see the word church in the Bible, we have to understand that there's two ways that the word church can be used. It is used of the universal church, or what we sometimes call the invisible church, which is all Christians everywhere. Wherever they are in the world, or even in glory itself, they're part of the body of Christ. And so they're part of the universal, invisible church. But then there is the visible church as well, which is often spoken of in the scriptures, and that's the church in Colossae. That's an actual geographical church that's located in a particular place. And we understand that Jesus is responsible as the head for the invisible church, but also uh, for the way that a local church functions as well and even grows. We see that Jesus grows the body. He grows the body as a universal church, the invisible church, by every, every, every time that someone is converted, 
It is by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one is converted without the head's approval. It is the head, Jesus Christ, that brings people and adds them, adopts them into God's family. And it is also by Jesus as the head that he brings people along to a local church. Whenever someone comes through the doors of a local church, whenever someone wants to be added to a body of believers, like the people were added to the body of believers in Colossae so many years ago and are added to the body of believers here at Moines or anywhere else in the world, it is only by the head's approval, by the Lord Jesus Christ bringing those people in. It's actually a miracle. Every time someone comes through the doors of the church and says, I want to be a part of this church, and it's only because of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of his church. So Jesus is responsible for growth in the church as the head. But he's also, we learn in the Bible, that he is responsible for the functioning of the church. As the head, he is responsible for the way that the church functions, the way that the church operates. And this is taught to us in the book of Ephesians as well. Ephesians chapter 4, if you'd like to turn with me, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, reading from verse 15 where uh, the uh, Apostle Paul is just beginning to speak about uh, the way that uh, we should live as Christians. And so we read in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 4, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. What is the head responsible for? For growth, we see there in verse 15, but also for building up in love as each part does its work. It's only through the head's direction that we love and do our work. So Jesus is the head of the church. He is the one that is responsible for the growth of the church, both the invisible church, of course, and then at a local church level, and also the functioning of the church, that the way that the church functions in love, doing their work, it is only because of Jesus Christ. Now, then you may be asking, why does, the church, why does Jesus get to be the head? Why is Christ the head of the church? And the Apostle Paul, if you turn back to Colossians chapter 1, is very clear to establish Christ's headship and give reasons why Jesus is the head of the church and why we don't put another human up as some, uh, some religions like to do. They like to establish somebody else as the head of the church. No, Jesus is the head of the church. Why? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us reasons. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He is the one who is supreme. Why? Well, one reason is because he is the firstborn from among the dead. Christ's resurrection establishes him as head of the church. He is the one who has power over death, over spiritual death in the fact that he can bring about regeneration, but also physical death. And that power he then uses for us, the power that he has for his own resurrection, he then uses for us. And this is clearly taught back in Ephesians chapter 1 as well. If you look back to Ephesians chapter 1, also written by the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, where he speaks about his prayer for the church in Ephesus, but then he moves on to the power of Jesus Christ, which is working in the church and is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Chapter 1, verse 18 of Ephesians, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, what's that power like? That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be, to be what? To be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We see there again this teaching from the Apostle Paul that Jesus is the head and the church is the body. And 
It's wonderful that Jesus is the head because he is the one who has that resurrecting power that we so desperately need to be at work in us. And the wonderful teaching there from Ephesians chapter 1 is that God uses that same power for our blessing. That is part of our inheritance as his body. But why else would we have Jesus as our head? Yes, he is the one who has great power. It's so wonderful to know that Jesus is the perfect head. He will never shut down. He will never die. And so therefore, we will never die. We will never shut down. If the head never shuts down, then the body won't shut down. But why else is Jesus clearly supposed to be the head of the church? Well, if you turn back to Colossians chapter 1, what comes in the very next verse? Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Another reference again to the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that very clearly last week in chapter 1, verse 15 of Colossians, that he is the image of the invisible God. And here it's repeated for us again. We need to be reminded that Jesus is God. So who should be head of the church? Should be God. Who is God? As the children like to answer, Jesus. If you say Jesus for any question, Jesus is the answer. And that's because Jesus is God. He is the one who has all authority. He is the one who has supremacy because he is God. And then what's another reason why Jesus should be head of the church? Well, the Apostle Paul goes on in verse 20 after speaking about the fullness of God dwelling in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus is head because of his work of reconciliation, his work of redemption. He bought the church, his body, with his own blood. Has anyone else done as much for the church as the Lord Jesus Christ has? Yes, people have shed their blood, but have they shed blood like the precious lamb of God that atones for the sins of all his people? No one has shed their blood in the way that Jesus Christ did as a perfect lamb of God. And so therefore, as the one who has bought the church with his blood, he therefore is clearly the one who should be head of the church. And in that passage we see then in Isaiah, many hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus came on the earth, And that prophecy that was given in Isaiah chapter 49 about the servant of the Lord. We know many of the uh, passages in Isaiah that speak of the servant of the Lord, of the Messiah, and particularly uh, chapter 52 and 53, uh, about the suffering of the servant. But there in chapter 49, what did we read earlier in verse 7? This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, He was despised. That work of reconciliation is mentioned there. But then what is said, kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. It's all through the Old Testament that this Messiah would be the one who would rule over all things and particularly his body, the church. So Jesus is the head of the body, the church. What does that mean for us? How do we respond to this fact that Jesus is the head of the body, the church? Well, we consider the two functions of the church. What was the one um, two functions of the head? What was one of the functions? Well, the first function that we saw of the head was growth, that Jesus is responsible for growth in the church. So how do we respond to that if Jesus is responsible for growth of the church? Well, one thing that we should do as the body of Christ is accept Christ's body. We should be accepting of what the head has done in bringing people into his body. Why do I say this? Well, it's because it's always easy enough to find a reason to grumble about someone who is part of the body, the church. I'm not talking about having a problem with someone who is in serious sin and we need to address that. I'm talking about the petty grumbling of, I just don't like that person attitude. There's all kinds of reasons why we don't like other people within the church. I've heard them all. Someone's too old or too young, too loud, too quiet, too rude, too polite. Someone who's too polite, they're always saying, sorry, 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 sorry. They're always too polite, too boring, too full on, too rich, too poor, 
too generous, too stingy, too hot, too cold, too lukewarm. It doesn't matter what you are. Someone will have a problem with who you are. And we find that rising in our own hearts about other people within the church as well. I've heard them all because they often surface in my own mind about people within the church. But if Christ is the head of the church, then we as his body have to accept, unite with all the body. It is Jesus who tells us who the body is, and we then accept those members of the body. We are not the ones who decide who's in and who's out. No, Jesus is the one who decides who's in and who's out. And we simply accept those people as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as part of his body. We have to remember, particularly the members of Des Moines Baptist Church, we have to remember that at a church members meeting, we never make members of the church. We never make people members of the body of Christ. We simply recognize those who are already members of God's church and accept them into membership. We ask, are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we see signs of repentance in your heart and in your life? And then we recognize what God has done in accepting you into his body already. And we then baptize and accept you into membership if you haven't uh, already been accepted, baptized and accepted into another church. And so we have to remember that at Des Moines Baptist Church. And, those, and, and so that's one way that we're to accept members, uh, accept the body of Christ. But then it's also on the responsibility on those outside the membership of the church to also accept those people who are part of the church as well that people should want to be part of the body at a local church level, that they should want to be accountable to other brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly that's where the issue of church discipline comes in. It should be, want to, it should be part of our desire in every person's heart to be locked in as a membership of a local church. Once you're locked in at the membership of the invisible church, the universal church, Christ's body, then you should be wanting to accept a local body of believers as well and be united with them. If Christ wants a hair here and a bald patch over there, that's his prerogative. And we are not to grumble that we don't like a hairy bit there or a bald patch over there. That's his choice as to who he brings into the church. What does Christ want from us? He wants unity and acceptance of the body of Christ. And if you don't agree with that, then you need to spend some time this afternoon, this afternoon reading and meditating on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which speaks about the body of Christ and how we need to be accepting and uniting in love with the body of Christ. So that's one thing that we can do in response to the fact that Jesus is the head of the body. If Jesus is the head of the body, then he is responsible for growth. And that then means that we need to accept the growth that comes even if we don't like some of those growths on the body, so to speak. But if Jesus is also in charge of growth, we should respond by praying to Christ for growth. We should re respond by praying to Christ for growth. There are numerous books and strategies for church growth. But humble prayer to the head is the best strategy of all. Why is that? Why is prayer the best strategy? Well, if it's only if the head desires growth, will we ever see growth? Think about your physical body. Okay, you can go stand in some manure and hope that you will grow. But if the head doesn't want you to grow, you will not grow. It doesn't matter what you do with your body. You will not grow unless the head decides, yes, I want growth. And it's the same for us at Des Moines Baptist Church. I could start a hundred different programs at Des Moines Baptist Church. And people like to suggest programs to me. We, if we start this, we're gonna see some growth. If we start that, we're gonna see some growth. And I often will say, oh yes, that sounds like a lovely idea. Why don't you go right ahead? And they say, well, you'll have to be a part of it, Joel. And I'll say, well, I've already got my strategies going on here. We could start program after program after program but we are not going to see growth unless the head is interested in seeing growth. And so what does that then mean for us? 
well then we need to go back to the head again and again and again and ask for growth prayer is like the great nerve system which connects us to the head for growth and we should all be sending signals if jesus is the head of the church and we want the church to grow we should be sending signals back to the head and asking for growth and the question for you this morning is do you do you pray to god to your head to the lord jesus christ and ask for growth in his church at a universal level yes but also at a local level do you pray for the people of Moines that they would come in and be saved through jesus christ so we've seen two ways that we can respond particularly if jesus is the one who causes growth in the church we respond by acceptance and by prayer for growth but remember the other way that we learn about Jesus through him being the head. What is the head? How does the head show his ruling authority in the body? Well, it's by the proper functioning of the body. The proper functioning of the body. The reason my hand works is because the head wants it to work. And it's the same for Christ. The only reason any member of his body works is because Christ causes functioning of it. So then what does that mean for us? Well, it means we do our job, not Christ's. We do the job that, God, uh, that Christ has given us and not Christ. There's always a, ten, a temptation for us as members of the body to usurp the head's authority and want to do the head's job and be in control of the members of the body as only the head is. We love to tell others what to do. And we love to tell our, even ourselves what to do. And often those rules that we put upon other members of the body or even upon ourselves are contrary to what the head actually desires and so we've usurped the head's authority we're doing his job when we shouldn't be and we're not concentrating on our job what we should be doing we should let the head be the head and concentrate on our job as best we can and what's our job as members of the body what is our function that the lord jesus wants us to do well it's love we saw that in ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 ephesians chapter 4 Verse 15, it says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. What is our job? It's not to do Jesus' job. No, he is the head. We are to concentrate on love. Love for God and love for our neighbor. That is our job, and we should get concentrating on that if we are the body and not the head of the church. And of course, the way that we exercise that love is shown by the use of the gifts that Jesus has given us. As his head, he has caused us to grow and develop in different ways, which makes the church so diverse and wonderful. And so we enjoy it, uh, that this church is so colorful in all the different ways, just like you look at the human body, it's not just one big blob like a jellyfish, although I'm sure a jellyfish probably is more complex, and, but me and my limited understanding of jellyfish biology, I'm sure. Uh, but you look at the human body, it is a very complex, uh, a very complex piece of anatomy, so to speak. And yet there's then that, that beauty that is there as each part does its work. And so we as members of Christ's body have to look at what are the gifts that Jesus has given us and then use those gifts in love and concentrate on doing the job that we are called to do. And that's what Romans 12 teaches us. Romans chapter 12, if we look at verse 4. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. We see again the Apostle Paul. He loves this idea that Jesus is the head and that we are the body. Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 4. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to himself, no, to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. 
If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in prophes uh, pro uh, proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. There's some gifts that are listed there. But of course, you could uh, find more and more different gifts that are, are given in the Bible that the Lord Jesus kindly, graciously gives his body in differing measures. And so we need to concentrate not on being the head, which is what we like to do, whether it be the head of other members of the body or even head of ourselves. No, we concentrate on being the best elbow or the best foot we can possibly be and leave Jesus as the head to organize everybody else. But you may be saying, oh, but it's really hard being a pinky toe in the body. The rest of the body walks all over me. What do I do? What do I do? Well, remember, proper function comes from Christ the head. So what do we do? We pray to Christ for strength to keep on functioning as the best pinky toe we can possibly be. Remembering that the pinky toe cannot do anything without the head's help. If the pinky toe is disconnected from the head, what will happen? It'll wither and die. And so we need to keep going back to the head and asking for help. We cannot fight temptation. You may think you're robust and strong, but you cannot fight temptation and work hard in love without prayer to the head for help. We need help from him because it's the head that energizes us as we are doing our work in love. And it is the head that can give us resources to help us as we seek to serve him as best we are able. Think of your human body. Think of your pinky toe. When it's hurt, what happens? Well, your head gets hands involved, gets the leg involved to lift it up so that it's not having all the pain bearing down upon it anymore. And the hands get down there and see what they can do and massage it and pull out anything that may be there, uh, hurting it in some way. And that's the way our head functions as well. If Jesus is the head of the church, we send an impulse back up to him for prayer, uh, in prayer, and then he can get other members of the body to come to us and help us in our time of need. And so we can carry on functioning as even a pinky toe when the rest of the body is walking over the top of it. And sometimes that's what we're called to do is lay down our lives for the rest of the body. You just read some church history. There are many, many believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, members of his body that were killed in horrible circumstances. But we see them as martyrs of the faith that gave their lives for the sake of the body. And how were they able to do so? Because the head energized them. The head gave them the resources that they needed so that they could be a witness for Christ, even in terrible circumstances. So if Christ is the head of the body, the church, then we have to accept the body. We have to pray for growth. We must work hard and also pray for strength to do that work that he has given us. But why should we accept Christ as a head of the growth and function of the body? Why should we do so? Well, because he gives joy to our hearts when we understand that he is the head of the body and we are simply members of that body. Rather than complaining about the diversity of the body and how everybody's different from me and I don't like them, instead we rejoice that Christ grows his body with such interesting people including weird people like ourselves. All those things that I listed before, I could say them about myself at different times of my life. We're all weird and wonderful. But if Jesus is the head of the body, then we accept one another and we look at how we are all weird and wonderful and rejoice in that truth and give him glory that we're not all the same. But instead, he calls us to himself in all our weird and wonderful colors. And if Jesus is the one who causes the proper functioning of the body, we can rejoice 
that everything is going according to his plan and every part of the body is working and moving just as he wants it to be. But you may say, oh, there's no perfect church. There's no perfect church. Well, yes, there is. There's the one that Christ's spirit has brought you to right now because if there was a better place for you to be, then you would be there, remembering that Jesus is the head. He is the one who has all power. He has all wisdom there, and he's a good and loving head. And so you're exactly where you need to be for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yes, your church may not be the perfect holy church that we look forward to in glory to come, but it's exactly the training ground that Jesus wants you in right now. Otherwise, he would have taken you to a different church. And you'd be training in that ground there and learning to accept and love other people and concentrate on your job of working in love with those people. And so there's a joy that comes of knowing that, for me personally, that I'm in the right place right now. At Dremoyne Baptist Church at this moment in time is the perfect place for me to be because otherwise the head would have put me in a different place. He is in charge at all times. And so there's a great relief that comes to my heart. And there's a great joy that then follows that relief. But I should also give a word of warning this morning. If you see yourself dissatisfied with the church, and you see yourself not functioning in love for God and others as you should, as the word commands you to, you should ask yourself, are you still attached to the, the head? Are you actually part of the body of Christ? And that's a warning that's actually given in Colossians chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Colossians, verse 19. Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. Speaking about people uh, in, who delight in false humility in verse 18. Uh, speaking about false teachers, verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize, such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. And then what's the warning? Verse 19, he has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. There are people who look like they're part of the body of Christ, but are not actually part of the body of Christ. They have lost connection with the head. They do not have a connection to the head. And why should you ask yourself the question whether you are attached to the body or not, particularly if you're dissatisfied with the church, particularly if you're not functioning as a member of the body should function? Well, because then joy will not result in your heart and instead pain will come to both your body and soul, particularly for all eternity. If you've lost connection with the head, if you're not connected to the body of Christ and then connected back to the head, then one day you'll be turned into hell for all eternity. And so you will not have the joy of being part of the body and instead you'll have the horrors of hell exposed to your soul. If we grumble about the rest of the body and we don't do our job, then one day the head might just cause a hand to come with a scalpel and dig us out as a thorn that has been getting a free ride on the body all along. We're a foreign object in the body of Christ and he may remove us and judge us for all eternity as a result. Is there any possibility that you're a foreign object in the body of Christ? Particularly at a local level, Jesus says that the wheat and the tares will grow together and they'll be sorted out of the judgment day. Is there a possibility that you're a weed in Christ's harvest field or you're a foreign object, you're just a thorn that somehow has gotten stuck into the body of Christ and will one day be dug out and burned. May that not be. Look at your life. Are you dissatisfied with the church? Are you not functioning in love as you should? 
and take warning and repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus Christ. Ask for forgiveness for all the ways you have wronged him. And find acceptance through Christ and his blood at the cross. And then grow in Christ and live a life of love with Jesus as your loving head who cares for you. It's so wonderful to know that he is the head and therefore he cares for us as you care for your own body. We all like well, some of us are not happy with certain parts of our body. But generally speaking, we're very caring of our body parts. I think that's how Jesus thinks of you. He cares for each member of his body. That's his love for you. And that can be the love that you experience if you will only come in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that everybody hearing my voice right now is a part of the body of Christ. And if you're not, that you humble yourself and become a part of his body even now. Let's come to him in prayer. Let's speak with our head. Lord Jesus, you are the head and all glory belongs to you for the growth and functioning of your body. Thank you for including us in your body. But Lord, we come before you and ask for forgiveness for not accepting many parts of your body as we should and for functioning as we should and for praying for help, for the strength that we need to do our work in love. Lord Jesus, we ask that you as the head would give us strength to serve you well as members of your body. And Lord Jesus, as our head, we ask that you would cause growth, growth in your church worldwide, but growth also here at Dremoyne Baptist Church. We cannot cause a single person to come through our doors no matter what we do but you can and so lord we pray that you'd use us in our work but draw people in with cords of love so that they experience the joy we have of being members of your body and we pray this in your name amen we're going to sing our final song i chose it for the fourth verse in the fourth verse, it's uh, the song, And Can It Be? Fourth verse, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Please stand and sing. Thank you. 
Close with words from Revelation chapter 5. Speaking of the angels in heaven, in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Amen. Uh oh, let's see.